Great, thank you, Matthew. And welcome everybody to the afternoon of uh, January 20th, um, House Energy and Technology Committee. We have with us this afternoon, Secretary Moore, um, Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to um, have a discussion this afternoon of uh, a couple of things um, kind of woven together. Um, last year, uh, this committee did a lot of work on and the legislature passed the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, one of the per first parts of the Global Warming Solutions Act to um, go into effect and go into action is um, the work of the Climate Council, which Secretary Moore serves on. And as part of the uh, Budget Adjustment Act, which is one of the first appropriations activities to go through the legislature this year, um, there is a request in, um, uh, in that budget adjustment uh, for a million dollars to support the work of the uh, Climate Council. So um, Secretary Moore is here to, uh, today to give us a little update on the work of the Council as well as this uh, budget adjustment request. And for members of the committee um, and for folks listening on YouTube, one of the things that policy committees of jurisdiction will typically do is to um, make, an, uh, make a recommendation to the Appropriations Committee on um, issues that are kind of in our policy bailiwick, which this obviously is. So uh, with that brief introduction, um, Secretary Moore, thanks for being here. Appreciate you having, I appreciate you making time for us and sure. also want to welcome um, Representative Feltus from the Appropriations Committee. Um, and this is an area that Representative Feltus covers. So thank you for joining us as well. Um, and Secretary Moore, you have control of the screen if you want to, um, to pull up some information. Great. Uh, I just want to start by introducing Emily Byrne, who is uh, ANR's Chief Financial Officer. And so to the extent you have detailed questions, um, she is here to, to help assist with those as well. Great. Will, Thank you. You're welcome. So I will share my screen. Um, maybe if you can just confirm for me that you can see it. Yep. Just came up. All right. Fantastic. Oh, that's not going to work if I move it over. Never mind. <laughs> I'll just, you'll get me in profile while I walk through the presentation. Okay. Um, so as you indicated, Chair Briglin, I'm going to start by just giving an, an overview of the progress report that was submitted to the General Assembly uh, this past Friday, and then get into a few details about the, the budget adjustment request. Um, just as a, a refresher um, for folks who may not have thought about the Global Warming Solutions Act uh, a, a whole lot over the last four months, um, there are a series of specifics um, related to what we ultimately need to include in the Vermont Climate Action Plan um, that go beyond just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also looking at ways to encourage smart growth, um, looking at opportunities for carbon sequestration, uh, trying, working to achieve net zero emissions by, by 2050. And that is um, a little bit different than, than the other requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act, which set uh, explicit greenhouse gas emissions reductions targets. So uh, we need to be looking at both of those pieces. Uh, reducing energy burdens uh, with particular emphasis on rural and marginalized communities looking at opportunities to reduce or limit the use of chemicals that contribute to climate change, and then um, seeking efforts to, to build uh, resilience in Vermont's communities uh, with a particular emphasis on natural and working lands. Uh, in addition to, to sort of the initiatives piece uh, that would get at those requirements, there are a series of objectives that are identified also for the Climate Action Plan, including, including uh, looking at cost effectiveness, um, making sure that, that we sort of spread the requirements across all of the different sectors that can contribute to greenhouse gas emissions reduction or greenhouse gas emissions currently. Um, again, focusing on, on trying to avoid or at least minimize negative impacts to marginalized and rural communities. Um, ensuring that, that this is a statewide approach and all regions of the state benefit from these efforts, trying to support economic growth um, while doing greenhouse gas emissions reductions, um, including looking at both um, 
the, the industries and the technology and the training that will allow us to take advantage of the work that, that lies ahead, not only for Vermont, um, but for the nation and, and frankly, for the world. Looking at ways to support the use of natural solutions to sequester carbon and then maximizing our involvement in interstate and regional initiatives. So there's a, there's a fairly aggressive schedule um, that's been established in the Global Warming Solutions Act. As you may recall, the act was um, passed over the governor's veto on September 23rd and the Global Warming Solutions Act allowed 60 days from enactment for the General Assembly to make appointments uh, to the Climate Council. The Climate Council is comprised of 23 members, 15 appointed by the General Assembly, and then eight uh, representatives of the administration. And once the administration received the final appointments, which we did on October 23rd, we had 30 days to convene the first meeting of the Climate Council. Um, and our first meeting was held on November 20th. Um, we then did submit our first annual progress report just last week. The draft of the Climate Action Plan uh, needs to be prepared and available for public comment by October 1st. So we have the, an aggressive schedule in front of us. And then um, we'll be moving to adopt the Climate Action Plan by December 1st of this year. Uh, so to date, the council has actually met four times, although the meeting on the 14th of this month was a rather abbreviated meeting simply to review uh, the draft report before it was submitted to the General Assembly. Uh, the inaugural meeting of the Climate Council was really what I would call State Government 101. Uh, we, talk, we did introductions of members um, and then talked about open meeting law requirements, uh, pu requests for public documents, as well as conflict of interest. Um, then the, the two meetings, the one in, on December 21st and the second on January 4th, we're really focused on, on the inventory of the state's existing activities. Uh, we received a presentation on the 21st from the state climatologist, uh, Dr. Dupigny Giroux from UVM, as well as uh, an overview of our existing emissions inventory efforts and current strategies that state government is utilizing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, then at the January 4th meeting, we had a presentation from Susanna Davis, the state's executive director for racial equity, about equity considerations in looking at different climate change solutions. Um, and then uh, received a similar overview of the inventory of existing state efforts related to resilience, as well as work that's being done around uh, quantifying both the, the ongoing and potential for additional sequestration of carbon on our natural and working lands. So really forests and agricultural um, lands. We do have another meeting scheduled um, for January 25th. So this coming Monday, the intention of the council is to meet the fourth Monday of the month um, going forward. So that will be our standing meeting date. On the 25th, we have actually engaged a, a consultant uh, facilitator to support us, but the, the purpose of that meeting is to both hear some lessons learned from um, other states that have recently undertaken a similar planning effort. So we have folks joining us from Maine, Massachusetts, and New York, as well as the US Climate Alliance. Um, and then we're going to have a, a facilitated discussion about process design and sort of the overall organizational structure and my hope is we'll come out um, the end of that meeting with subcommittee assignments and plans for the first meetings of the subcommittees, which is where we're really anticipating sort of the substantive work will take place. Uh, this sequence of work is really established in the, the, the act itself. Um, and we've just sort of massaged it a little bit um, as, as we've begun the process of, of thinking through how we'll actually conduct the work but it is this idea of inventorying existing programs and then evaluating uh, the need for and opportunities for new strategies and programs, including cost effectiveness, thinking about how we're gonna pay for this work. Um, there's, and then there's a similar uh, set of efforts around the necessary steps to build resilience. Developing a monitoring strategy, um, and the engineer in me would tell you that it's really important to do this work as part and parcel of program design so that you already have anticipated what you're going to seek to measure um, while you, before you've actually built the projects. Um, 
And then ultimately we need to identify the rules that the Agency of Natural Resources will need to adopt, as well as any recommendations we will bring back to the legislature um, regarding, change, regarding changes in statute. Um, and all of those things need to be laid out in the Climate Action Plan, um, which will be adopted by the council um, on or before December 1st of this year. And then uh, the plan is to be updated every four years thereafter. There are, as I indicated, uh, there, are, there are four subcommittees um, included or specifically called out in the Global Warming Solutions Act. And this is really where we anticipate um, the, the majority of the, the substantive work will take place. And then there will be, this information will be brought back to the council and they will seek to integrate it into an action plan. Um, the four subcommittees identified are the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee, the Cross-Sector Mitigation Subcommittee, which is really looking at, at cost effectiveness of different solutions, um, Just Transition Subcommittee, which is, is where those equity considerations will find a home, um, and then an Agriculture and Ecosystem Subcommittee. There's also an allowance within the Global Warming Solutions Act for any other subcommittees identified by the Council is necessary to our work. Um, and we have had at least preliminary conversations about the idea of forming a science and data subcommittee. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what I'm envisioning there if, if that would be of interest to, to the um, committee. Maybe pause there before shifting gears and talking about um, the, the specific, the funding that's available currently to support our efforts under the Global Warming Solutions Act and, and what we believe it will take to fully fulfill the requirements. Uh, I had a couple of questions, um, uh, Secretary Moore, and uh, that's actually probably a, a, a good time to ask them. Um, a couple relate to some things you've just talked about. And then one um, actually to this slide right here. So I'll hold on to that one. Um, but, but one question is you, you had mentioned um, some of the coordinated discussion work conversation that's going on between uh, perhaps it's your office, perhaps it's the, it's the broader climate council with um, other regional states that have done this work or, or maybe are a little farther along in this work, Maine, uh, Maine and Massachusetts and New York, certainly. I think Maine and New York are um, maybe a year or so ahead of us. What's your sense as to um, how the process that they've gone through in particularly Maine, because it's a, certainly a more similar state um, to us than I would say New York is, but how that work might inform the process that we're going to take on? Um, and you know, what, what can we learn from things that have worked for them or have not? So um, I have had uh, the opportunity to talk with both the, the acting commissioner of their Department of Environmental Protection, so essentially my counterpart for Maine, as well as um, a woman named Hannah Pingree, who works directly in the governor's office and is the governor's lead on, on climate action. Um, and I, I do think that there, there's a lot that we can, can glean and gain from their experience. And frankly, I'm really grateful that they're gonna participate um, in the discussion on Monday and, and provide an overview. Uh, I, I think you know, some of the, the things I took from the, the conversations with them thus far is the, the importance of thinking about um, equity considerations early on, that that hadn't been a focus of their climate action planning. And so now they are bringing um, those considerations in as part of the, the implementation work. Um, and it, it's more challenging. I think if they had it to do over, uh, they probably would have chosen to, they would choose at this point to do more of it on the front end. Uh, I think there's an important distinction between the way our act is structured and the way Maine's is structured. And, and it sort of hinges on that point, which is um, that, that they, I would describe their plan sort of stops at the, the what. Here are a series of strategies um, that could be used to help achieve these um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions goals. Uh, our, I would say our Global Warming Solutions Act actually requires us to get to the, the how. Not only what are we gonna do, but, but how are we gonna do it in terms of changes in rule and changes in statute programs that need to be established, et cetera. So, so we have to sort of go to that, that next step, whereas they've kind of, they, they're in the process of thinking about what that second step um, um, looks like from their end. 
The, the other piece uh, I know they spent a lot of time on, which has less, less um, connections for us, was, was spent a lot of time wrestling uh, how to deal with sea level rise and the impact that that, that could have um, on their overall program and changes in land use policy in particular that needed to, to flow from um, assumptions they would make about uh, expected changes in, in sea level conditions. Um, the other piece they, they talked about was sort of the, the public participation and engagement and the importance of that. Um, I think that there's a sharp contrast between the way Maine approached this work and Massachusetts approached this work from that regard, which was uh, Massachusetts sort of developed their action plan within state government um, and then took it out for public comment as opposed to this council type process um, that Maine used, which is very similar, I think, to uh, our process here that, that sort of it engages the public from the get-go and makes public particip broader public participation, not just the council, but overall um, more clearly an expectation of how the plan will be developed. That's helpful. Um, my sense would be that you know, the process of incorporating that public feedback and public input is really important and also time consuming. Um, and that may have affected uh, Maine's calendar one way or another in the process that, that they went through. Um, I'm not as familiar with what Massachusetts did. But yeah, no, so Maine had indicated it, it took them about 14 months um, to, to uh, get from sort of go to having a their, their action plan. But as I say, their plan, I think, stops a little bit short of where ours is anticipated to, to stop right now. Um, and I just wanted to pull up my notes. The other thing that, that Hannah had shared was um, that actually ties nicely into the second part of this presentation, which was um, they hadn't really made um, or plans for modeling and in particular the cost benefit analysis, she said sort of early enough to be done early enough on in their work. And it actually became sort of a, a pinch point um, as, they were, as they were getting to the place of having identified a series of strategies and then wanting to do the work to sort of evaluate and analyze those different strategies. They didn't actually have the, the modeling um, contractors in place and, uh, on the timeline they wish they had and so sort of had to wait for those pieces to catch up because that part of the evaluation um, was both really central to, to um, prioritizing different strategies uh, and also not within sort of the, the capabilities, I guess I would say, of, of state government. Okay, and, and I don't want to lead the witness, but I'm guessing this is going to get into some of the money discussion that we're going to have in a few minutes. It, it um, w w one, one quick question on um, uh, the, the work within ANR, and it might be within the Department of Environmental Conservation. I, I can't recall where it exists at ANR, um, but annually the greenhouse gas emissions inventory comes out. And uh, last year it was around this time of year. I can't remember exactly, but do you have a sense as to when that the next one might be published? Is that clear yet? Uh, I don't have a, a specific timeline. I, um, the presentation, so it is within DEC that that work is done. Um, and as part of the presentation that was given at the De December 21st CAB Climate Council meeting, uh, the staff did preview what they are anticipating. I think it's important to keep in mind that those inventories lag um, by several years. And so if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the sort of extended predictions they offered were actually for 2017 and 2018, um, and that we haven't published those data sets yet. But I'm, I'm happy to send around uh, the link to that presentation, which, which does have those, those forecasted um, elements in it at this point, or I may actually, I can probably bring it up while we're, we're talking even once once we get through the Yeah, that's okay. And I, I don't mean to interrupt your presentation, but I, I would welcome that if um, if that's something you could email along or, or, or text and I'll make sure that it gets in the committee, um, uh, you know, the, on the committee website. Just as an aside, um, you know, sometimes reports that the legislature gets uh, go to a a central office someplace. I don't know where that central office is. And there's a delay in those yeah. coming to committees. Um, I'm not sure if we've actually uh, seen the Climate Council report yet in our committee. Oh, right. um, 
and again, that it could be stuck someplace in the system and just hasn't gotten to our, our committee yet. Um, it, so. I, I will make sure to send a, a, either a copy of the report itself or a link to where the report lives. Um, Terrific. Yep. Great. Um, Rep Representative Yantachka, did you have a question? I see your hand up. Yes. Um, thank you, Julie, for your presentation. Um, uh, speaking of the Department of Environmental Conservation Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report, that probably will not reflect uh, any effects that the pandemic had on emissions, right? Not, not at this point in time. We, it really is, uh, it, it lags by several years in part because we rely on regional and national data sets to inform certain parts of the inventory. And so the, the most current data we have, which is, I would call it provisional, it's not, it, we haven't finalized it yet, is for 2018. So we don't yet have the ability to look at the impacts um, of, of the, the pandemic on greenhouse gas emissions. I, anecdotally, there are certainly stories that, that um, news stories that talk about um, fairly significant reductions as a result of the reduction in, largely in vehicle miles traveled, um, but we won't have benefit of, of the, that information in sort of our current emissions control format um, probably for at least another two years. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other hands up, uh, Secretary Moore. So if you wanna. All right. Do you charge uh, ahead? Yes, I, so maybe turning our attention then to, to funding. Um, as you may recall, the, the General Assembly appropriated $450,000 um, into ANR's base budget to support the, the work to accomplish the goals of the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, there, that money was it had sort of three stated purposes attached to it. One uh, was to hire three staff positions um, and provide a, a modest operating budget for those staff positions. Those positions are a, a project manager, um, a, a sort of project technician or program technician, so some an entry level position to help with research and other work, and then a, a lawyer. Um, to help as we move into the second phase of the Global Warming Solutions Act and the, the rulemaking component. Um, we have made an offer to somebody to serve as the Global Warming Solutions Act project manager and hope to be in a position to, to um, share all of that information publicly by the end of this week. Uh, we are in the process of, we're working through the process with DHR right now to get the program technician job description posted and anticipate hiring um, or putting out a uh, um, job description for the, the lawyer position later this spring. Um, given that timeline, we are anticipating we will use about 194,000 of the 450 uh, for the, the salaries and benefits and associated operating costs associated with those three positions. In addition, we've budgeted uh, $46,000 for per diems for the Climate Council and that means there's about $210,000 in our FY21 budget available for contracted services. The types of contracted services uh, we believe are necessary to deliver the climate action plan, I would put into three big buckets. Uh, one is technical, so it's, it's modeling. Uh, one is facilitation, and then one is communications and outreach. Um, as you may have seen, the Budget Adjustment Act includes a, a request for, for $1 million for the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, this is really a, a one-time money request, and um, this is what we're looking at overall in terms of contractual needs. So we have that $210,000 in our FY21 budget, um, and we think we need 1.21 in total. Um, 850,000 of that is for technical support. Um, so emissions modeling, the economic and cost benefit analysis, and then work, helping us work on that framework for monitoring and program evaluation. We issued a request for information about a week and a half ago now, um, trying to, to sort of hone the scope as well as our, our cost estimate. Um, the, the, what we put out is drawn from the experiences gleaned from other neighboring states, um, but certainly our, our scope has its own aspects and attributes. Uh, responses to the RFI are due February 6th. Our, my hope is that we will be in a position to turn around and issue uh, the formal request for proposals before the end of February, um, and ideally have folks under contract to help us 
help with this work um, by the end of March. Uh, the facilitation pieces I've broken into two. Uh, we did issue a small contract to an entity called the Consensus Building Institute, CBI, uh, that also facilitated Maine's Climate Council process and has previously done work in Vermont, largely for the Agency of Agriculture, uh, to support our January 25th meeting, um, including both meeting facilitation, but they're also doing interviews with council members uh, this last week and this week um, to inform and support that meeting. Uh, we believe that, that these types of services are really going to be essential. Um, it won't be full-time facilitation for every meeting of the council and its subcommittees, but certainly to have them available as a resource um, and helping ensure the, the process continues to go move along, um, as well as working with what we are anticipating will be a steering committee uh, that will sort of guide the, the larger plenary sessions that the council will hold in the coming months. And then we've anticipated a fairly significant budget uh, for public engagement. Uh, we know that that was an important facet of the way the Global Warming Solutions Act was structured and there's a need to, to sort of get out uh, to all corners of the state and solicit public comment and input on the plan once it's available. Um, as well, we're envisioning that the, we will want to provide opportunities as the subcommittees are, are in the throes of, of their work uh, to have that, uh, to have a public process associated with that as well. Uh, this table provides just a bit more detail in, in how all those, those costs sugar off for this coming year um, and, and shows that the, the total we're estimating is this 1.45 million. I would note not all of the one-time expenses will be incurred in FY21, but it's also really hard to draw the line between what's in FY21 and, F and what would be an FY22 expense. All of this work will need to be complete by December 1st when we deliver the action plan. Um, and so it seemed like this was the, sort of the most thoughtful way um, and most straightforward way to present our request. Uh, Going forward, I just want to be clear that um, when, once we get through sort of this initial push, um, we do believe that the annual appropriation of $450,000 will be sufficient to cover those three staff positions, operating needs, um, the, the per diems and other costs associated with regular meetings of the, um, the Climate Council, as well as delivering the annual report to the General Assembly that's required um, as part of the act. Uh, obviously, none of that's final till the governor delivers his budget next week, um, but, but as I sit here today, uh, I believe that that will be the case. Uh, Secretary Moore, I, I don't want to interrupt you. I wasn't sure if that was, that, yeah. that was, that was the end of your presentation. Uh, Representative, I I'm sorry. I can stop sharing the screen too, so you okay. can okay. see everybody I, again. I saw Representative Sevilla's hand uh, go up. Go ahead, Laura. Uh, if, if that is not the end, it looked like we were at the end, Secretary Moore, are we? Yes, okay. So um, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, is the RFI up on the website? Is that something that we can see? I, I will include that in what I mail to you. It's It's not, I don't think it's on the um, the Climate Council website that the Agency of Administration has established, but it is available on like the, the business registry website. So I, I will make sure to send you that link. That would be great. And uh, the, the things that I'm curious about, Secretary Moore, are the facilitation and communication and any additional detail you can provide about what's envisioned there. Sure. Um, so the, the facilitation one maybe is, is easier in part because I've spent quite a bit of time over the last week drafting that request for proposals. Um, and so I'm in a position to, to share at least with you my, my considered thinking, which is that the, the real pieces of the um, what we're looking at is, is to provide on, this ongoing process support, both to the council and to the subcommittees as they work to, to develop the plan. Um, so leading the monthly meetings of the Vermont Climate Council and then providing um, support to both the steering committee, which I am expecting we will form um, following the organizational work we're gonna do on Monday, as well as support to the, the subcommittees. 
Um, and th I think there's probably going to be different needs in terms of process support, um, particularly as the subcommittees work to develop recommendations. Um, and, you know, we're going to have co-chairs for each of those subcommittees that probably will have a variety of experience, professional experience and capacity on, on how to sort of um, guide a consensus building process around complex issues that are sure to come up. Um, and so it, it is our belief that having a, these facilitators as a resource for the subcommittees will, will help um, ensure their success. And then the last piece is really working with the council and the subcommittees um, to think about stakeholder meetings and public meetings where they make sense. And then the communications and outreach firm, they're sort of a handoff there. And the, they would actually help develop um, the materials that would be used for um, public to, to, gauge, to guide, excuse me, public participation, um, as well as doing a lot of the organizational work and logistics around scheduling these meetings, thinking about where we should have them, when we should have them, um, and how we can get the greatest participation by the most diverse group of stakeholders possible. Um, given that I think a lot of the recommendations of the Climate Council are likely to have ties into to sort of personal behavior, whether it's the, the type of vehicle you drive, the type of uh, heating system for your home, weatherization initiatives. And so it's really gonna be port important um, to do that, that direct engagement with the public, um, so have robust opportunities for them to provide review and comment, um, and hopefully uh, be able to successfully address and incorporate their feedback um, into the, the council's ultimate recommendations in the climate action plan. Um, I'm envisioning a process where the subcommittees do that initial work. They bring their, their reports and their recommendations back to the council. The council is going to consolidate that work um, into the sing singular climate action plan. And I also think that there will be an important role um, for the facilitator in that consolidation and how we make decisions. We're, we're going to establish charters for each of the subcommittees, trying to ensure uh, that there isn't uh, significant overlap or underlap in the, the, the scopes of work that they'll each be undertaking. Um, but I think knitting those pieces back into a cohesive overall action plan um, is going to be uh, a significant undertaking and we will benefit um, from having, having somebody help facilitate the council's work in that space. Does that Great. Help? Uh, that does help. Um, I would just offer um, with communication, I really hope, and I, and I have actually spoken to a few council members myself, um, I really hope that the greatest um, effort will be made to go to the places that are not ready to have this conversation, um, that, are, that don't want to have this conversation, because those are the places that are going to be the most deeply impacted by this conversation. Um, okay. And so we've got to be creative in our outreach and consistent and make sure that they, that we put places out there um, for them to connect to. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I think that that message was also um, loud and clear in Susanna Davis's presentation to the, the council earlier this, this month. Thank you. Thank you for your work, Secretary Moore, um, not just with this, but for everything you've been doing during the pandemic, it's greatly appreciated, you and all of your team. Thank you. Representative Pat. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I don't have a question. I, I, I want to just simply say that I, I, I know this is very, uh, so early in this process with this in, in, uh, in large uh, group of council members and all of the diversity of the membership of the council, as well as the uh, efforts you and others have been talking about, about uh, uh, public engagement. And uh, it, it feels very much to me from your presentation and what I've been hearing uh, that this is being um, uh, started out on uh, very much in the spirit uh, of the uh, of, of the bill that uh, we worked on that that's now law. And I greatly appreciate that. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Secretary Moore, uh, 
Could the, the, the biggest part of this uh, one-time appropriation through the um, through the Budget Adjustment Act, the eight hundred fifty thousand dollars for the technical support? I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to that I would understand all the uh, you know kind of granular undergirdings of that. But in in layman's terms, can you give us a little bit more background as to what you know what? What does emissions modeling work mean, and and what will that give you at the end of the day? Similarly, with the with the economic modeling, what, what's what's that going to um, present the council with? Sure. So the the emissions modeling, I I was a, a water quality modeler in my past life. So if I get into um, uh, jargon, please stop me. But uh, the it's it's. I would say at its core, it's scenario building, right? So if we're gonna pull together um, different parts and pieces of, of eight different strategies, right? How many uh, apples do you need versus how many oranges versus how many pears versus how many bananas? So in this case, how many electric vehicles do you need to see on the road by date certain to meet the 2030 target established or requirement established in the Global Warming Solutions Act? How many heat pumps um, how many uh, homes do we need to weatherize and how many anaerobic digesters do we need to build, for example. And then it's a, it's a big optimization problem, right, to figure out, okay, well, we've said it's not possible to have more than 200,000 electric vehicles on the road by 2030. So we've capped that one and maybe we need to turn the dials on these other three. And then you're constantly sort of looking at the balance you've struck um, between the, the different types of strategies you have available um, and trying to, to get to both something that reflects uh, the most reasonable cost, um, but also something that, that's actually feasible to, to implement. Um, there's also some work likely that needs to be done around just sort of how we track emissions in general. Um, we built our, our current uh, emissions inventory uh, for a fairly specific purpose, and that purpose was, was, is also established in statute. It's not clear that that inventory is exactly the right tool for actually being able to measure our progress towards the goals of the Global Warming Solutions Act. And so one of the, the pieces we're, we're going to ask, or at least I would anticipate that we would ask, um, is for some, some real um, deep thinking, so to speak, in, in that space about what it makes the most sense uh, to have be part of the, the inventories and how we will um, then use that information long-term. Um, and then the, the other piece I'm envisioning that, that will be part of that conversation is uh, I think we are likely, particularly as we start to look at the 2050 requirements, um, to potentially need to consider strategies for things that don't really exist yet. Um, I, and to me, there, there's an R&D component um, and then how you represent that and account for that in terms of building out what you're going to do in the early years to make sure that you're doing enough things that, that we're making the, the necessary progress towards the, the requirements of the act. Um, but at the same time, don't go so far in, in one particular area that we end up um, doing things that, that we might later regret or at least be proven not to, to be cost effective. And so having the ability to use the model to think not only about the tools that we know that exist today, but tools to estimate the benefits and impacts associated with tools that, that may not exist yet will be another um, important piece of that work. Does that help? It, that is helpful. And um, this follow-up question is not meant to um, question, frankly, the amount um, that, that's going to this sort of work. It sounds um, extraordinarily uh, complex and specialized in putting these models together. But a question I do have is, I know that there are some Vermont entities that have been doing this type of work. Maybe it's in a much more general fashion um, as to not be as um, granular or specific uh, to, to suit the needs of the, the work that the council is doing. But I guess I, 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 I can't help but ask, you know, is some of that work um, supportive of of uh, the, you know, the, the work that the council is doing, at least at this point? I, I think it will be. Um, I am hopeful that, that some of those organizations may choose to respond to the request for information and help us better understand what tools may already exist. 
Um, I know that there's work that's been done um, sort of jointly by UVM and Linden State, for example, uh, that may have, have real utility here. Certainly the Energy Action Network, uh, the Regulatory Assistance Project, and then there, there are a handful of sort of I guess I would call them boutique um, consulting firms that also uh, are, are headquartered here in Vermont, the Energy, Energy Futures Group. And there's a second one that are, that are both located um, in sort of the Richmond Hinesburg area that seem to have some particularized expertise that, that may be uh, quite helpful to us. Um, the other piece I, I am hopeful we'll be able to take advantage of is frankly, uh, similar work that's been done in, in adjoining states. Um, I know that, for example, uh, Columbia University has been doing a, a lot of work um, in support of, of New York State's climate action planning. Um, and I'm hopeful that some of the, the things that they've done to look both regionally at emissions modeling, as well as some of the, the cost benefit work um, may be able to be, to be brought into the evaluation we need to do. Um, that $850,000 number is, is the squishiest of the, the ones I've, I've presented um, and that it, it really is, you know, sort of a, a swag based on what we know a typical hour of consulting time costs and what we've heard from, from our neighbors um, in terms of the, the level of effort that was required for their plans. But as I say, none of these are identical. Um, and so my, my hope is that the, the RFI uh, will, will provide some insights there that'll allow us to, to refine that number a bit. Um, but obviously the timing of all these pieces is a bit challenging too. Great, thank you. Um, Representative Sims, I see your hand up. Thank you so much, this is incredibly helpful. As a new member, I'm uh, getting myself up to speed here. Um, so I apologize that this is sort of an uh, entry level question, but could, could you share a little bit more about how the modeling and um, in investments around innovations are around uh, mitigation of climate change, reduction of emissions versus sort of resiliency and like planning for um, the impacts of climate change here in Vermont? So that, that's a great question. Um, and, and it's one I think we're gonna need to wrestle with a bit as, as the council. The, certainly there, there is uh, several books of work. I, you know, if you sort of put them in the biggest, biggest um, possible categories, I would say it's the, the mitigation, right? The, the emissions reduction work, the adaptation and resilience work, and then the, the carbon sequestration work. Um, and each of those has, has sort of, areas of, of overlap and connectivity to one another, but they're fundamentally sort of three separate books of work. The way the act is structured, uh, the, the sort of legal obligations, at least to my agency, are, are all tied to the mitigation work. And so I, I think that, that that's going to be something we'll, we'll need to wrestle with in terms of how much weight to put on the, those, those different um, sort of opportunities and, and, and books of work. Um, and ensuring that we are both meeting the, the requirements of the law and at the same time, um, sort of the, the um, clear intent, as well as frankly, our moral obligations to look at ways to, to build resiliency across the landscape. So that, that's a great question and, and very much an, an unsettled matter right now. Great. Any other questions for the secretary? I don't see any hands up. Um, my, my understanding is that you are presenting uh, Julie to the appropriations committee, I think later this week. Um, and we'll, we'll keep our ears peeled for that as well. Um, if there aren't any other questions, um, I will say one more thank you. R really appreciate your work and, and all, all that you're doing. Um, on the council, but as Representative Sevilla uh, had said, just uh, you know, keeping the wheels on the government wagon uh, as we kind of operate in the pandemic now. Really appreciate um, uh, all your uh, attention and work to this matter in particular. So, um, uh, Representative Sevilla, I see your hand. You just got in under the wire there. Sorry, and actually, Mr. Chair, this question is for you. Um, how did how? Would you like the committee to, are we 
planning to make a recommendation? Do you want to act on that today? Is that something we'll do later this week? Yeah, I, so I will check in, uh, Marty, unless you've got any um, direction to give us, I was going to check in with the chair of the Appropriations Committee and certainly wait until they had heard um, the secretary's presentation. Um, what I'm hopeful to do is to carve a few minutes out of our schedule on Friday um, to have committee discussion on this, um, which certainly Marty is, is welcome to join us, uh, join with us in as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, in the past, we've, we've written a, something as formal as a letter to the Appropriations Committee. Um, you know, it can, can be an email as well. But, but fundamentally, what we are being asked to do is to make a recommendation to the Appropriations Committee on this. So, uh, you know, my sense is by the end of the week, we will do that. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I would say that, uh, Tim, I would say that that's what the Appropriations Committee is waiting for. Obviously, okay. you were instrumental committee in developing this legislation and you understand the legislation itself obviously better than our committee does but the requirement or the request will be are these i don't want to use the word legitimate but are these reasonable expenses that need to be incurred in order to appropriately administer the act that the legislature passed and that's the question that needs to be um considered it, you know, certainly from, from the Appropriations Committee, we sometimes get a little annoyed when we pass legislation and then we don't put enough money in the budget in order to do it. And people come back later and ask for more money. But the legislature passed the act. And so we need to determine if this is a, a reasonable request and if it's needed in order to implement the legislation that was passed and, and your recommendation of how to handle that. And then we'll have to obviously work it in with, with other needs and determine the best way to do that. Of course. Do, um, Marty, do you have a, a sense as to if we, if we come back to you by Friday, that, that would be sufficient for the work that you're doing? That would be sufficient. We will be working on this on Friday and, and probably Monday as well. I'm sure we will. Um, okay. But we would like your recommendation after you've had a little bit of a chance to think about it. Great. So, so Friday would be fine. Yep. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will plan on taking some time on Friday to collect our thoughts on this, and then um, I will formally pass those along to the um, uh, to the chair of the Appropriations Committee. So good. Um, okay. Thank you for joining us today, Marty and and uh, and Julie. Really appreciate your time. Thanks. And um, I believe, committee, that we're then our next meeting is tomorrow morning at uh, at nine a.m. Um, when we are going to have three guests, um, we're going to continue our connectivity discussion um, with some folks who will be joining us from the distribution, uh, electric distribution utility industry. It kind of strikes me today. It's, it's, we started off a couple of weeks ago talking about cybersecurity. We had um, the first year of a master's degree in uh, electric utility stuff on Friday. We've had a continual discussion on connectivity. Um, today, we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions and resiliency issues related to climate change. Um, it's been a pretty, pretty broad swath of things we've uh, heard from in the last couple of weeks. So um, anyway, appreciate your focus on this stuff. And any, uh, any questions or comments or thoughts? Uh, Laura? Yeah, one more, Mr. Chair, just around the reporting that's, uh, so I, I know Matthew is looking for um, that report and Secretary Moore has um, pledged to send us additional materials. How, um, what will our protocol be? Will we, should we expect that Matthew will send that to us, that we'll get an email, that it will be posted to the website? Do we know? Is that something we, we should share? It's something we're discussing right now. Um, All right, great. You know, <laughs> as I'd mentioned, as I'd mentioned, it's, um, and, and um, Matthew, uh, this is something we should get clarity on. You know, January 15th is kind of a magical date. I feel like there's a flood of reports that comes to the legislature at that time. Um, I feel like some of them go to some magic office in the legislature and then are distributed to committees. Some of them I feel like come directly to me uh, as a committee chair and, you know, maybe I'll pass them along to Matthew. Some of them might come directly to Matthew. Some of them are distributed to our entire committee 
and all members of the committee get an email on them. So there's no real kind of universal protocol on how this happens. And this is an example of, you know, somewhere this fell through the through the cracks. I'm not, um, I, I'm sure that ANR got this report to us. It's just, you know, wh where is it in the ether, so to speak? So um, what I would suggest just because of the timeliness of this, that um, Matthew, when you get that report, if you could directly email it to um, everybody on the committee, as well as um, what was the secretary going to follow up with? Um, the RFI. Right, I'm sorry, the RFI, uh, which I think is posted on the um, Climate Council website. Um, but Matthew, when you get that, if you could share that with the, the committee as well. So for this instance, let's make sure that um, each member of the committee get an email of that. Obviously, we've got the secretary's um, presentation uh, because it's posted on our website. And, uh, and obviously, with this testimony today, that's the information that will uh, take some time to discuss this on Friday. Does that work, we'll Laura? Also, I'll also add, I believe I found the correct report that uh, Secretary Moore is referring to, and it should be up on the committee page now under the Reports and Resources tab, assuming I found the right one. Um, but yeah, I will send that along in an email later this afternoon as well so that everyone has it. Great, that's helpful. And um, Matthew, I, again, I, I feel like I'm a relatively new committee chair and you're certainly a new committee assistant. Um, I would welcome if you might check in with, I'm not sure if it's Mike Ferrant or who the point person is in the General Assembly for when a report, a, a required report comes out of, it's usually the executive branch, but, but comes into the General Assembly where does it go and how is it disseminated? Because um, th there are a few reports that occasionally fall through the cracks. Um, that, so that would be helpful just to, for, for your edification and frankly mine as well. I'll definitely, yeah, I'll touch base with Mike and pass along what I learned. Cool, good. And we do have the report up on the website now. Yeah, great, thank I you. Good, okie doke. Uh, without further ado, let's adjourn and uh, we'll see y'all tomorrow. At